at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, conducted an interview in connection with the Veterans History Project. Uh, I'm here with Mr. Herschel Vaughn, and Mr. Vaughn, thank you very much for agreeing to come in here and share your life's experiences with us. I'm glad to do it, Joe. Would you give us your complete name, your address, and your date of birth, please? Yeah, well, it's Herschel Reed Vaughn, and uh, of course, I never went by Herschel until Herschel Walker got famous, then I figured that's a good name to have, you know. But um, I was born in Milledgeville, Georgia, on uh, 15th of March, 1924. And when I was about six or seven months old, my family moved to Atlanta. So I've always considered myself an Atlanta native. Uh, I presently live up in Cobb County, at, uh, uh, not too far from Sperry High School. So I, uh, I consider myself an Atlanta native, although I spent a lot of time out of Atlanta in those intervening years. Do you have brothers and sisters? Joe, I've got one sister, a younger sister, and uh, that's basically it. We're a very small family, really. And she lives in Atlanta. She's an Atlanta native also. She never left here. Oh, okay. So she's always been in Atlanta. When did you enter the military? I went in the military around uh, around February the 15th of uh, 1943, and prior to that time, I had tried to, well, you can get into this in a few minutes, well, I'll tell you more about that, but uh, I went in in 1943, in about February the 15th, right here in Atlanta, at Fort McPherson. How did your family feel about you going in? <laughs> they probably were glad to get rid of me. I ate too much. <laughs> the refrigerator was always empty when I was at home. <laughs> no, they, uh, they probably had the same feelings that most people had at that point in time. It was a necessary thing to do, and I don't think that there was uh, any real misgivings about it. Just something that was expected. And you were, what, 19 at the time? No, uh, I was 18. 18? Yeah. Okay. And did you volunteer, or were you drafted? No, that's an interesting story. Uh, when I was in high school, in my senior year in high school, I tried to volunteer. I tried to go into the uh, Navy Air Force cadet program and um, went, through the, went through the physical with flying colors till we got down to the last little thing, which was a book of color charts. And there was one color chart out of that whole book that I couldn't find that number in. And man, they showed me the door real fast. So. Um, when I did not uh, make it through the Navy, I tried the Army Air Corps. Same thing with the cadet program, because I really was intent on flying. Same problem. And uh, they put me down as being colorblind. Well, I'm not colorblind, but I had faulty color perception, which big difference. Mm -hmm. So um, I figured, well, with all due respect, Joe, I am not going into the Army. <laughs> so. Uh, I said, well, I got it. If, if, I, if, I can't, uh, if I can't get into one of these flying programs, they can just come get me. Well, they did. <laughs> so by the, the 15th of February is about the time that uh, my number came up. I was 1A of the draft, of course, and um, they came and got me. And this was a little bit over a year after Pearl Harbor. Do, do you remember yes. where you were and oh, what I the sure feeling did. was? Yes, I do. Um, you heard Pearl Harbor was Yeah, well? it was on Sunday, of course. and. Um, we had been to church, my mother and my grandmother. Uh, my father died when I was 12 years old, so um, it was just my mother and my grandmother and my sister. And we'd been to church and had come back home, and about, um, oh, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a couple of my friends pulled up. Believe it or not, they had a car. One of them had, a, had an automobile. And they pulled up and told me about Pearl Harbor being bombed. And uh, we turned the radio on right away, of course, and were able to uh, hear more about it from the radio broadcast there. Well, like most people, we were absolutely irate about it. You know, we were incensed about it. And um, several of my friends, of course, dropped out of high school at that point in time and went ahead and went in. And I would have done the same thing if I could have got what I wanted. Yeah. But um, I figured if I wasn't going to fly, I sure wasn't going to walk. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> So you went in in February of 43. Uh, would you tell us about your training, where, where you went, and your experiences sure. as you went through training? Well, of course, um, my going into the military was almost the traditional way. The first thing I did was go into Fort McPherson. And by the way, Fort McPherson was only about a quarter of a mile from where I lived. It was in walking distance. 
And I went into Fort McPherson out there, and the first thing they did was put me on kitchen patrol, kitchen police. And I peeled potatoes for about a week and found out what potatoes really looked like. And uh, at that point in time, thank goodness, um, they transferred me down to Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, which is where Keesler Air Force Base is. Uh, it, of course, the basic training, this was basic training. And of course, at that point in time, the Air Force was the Army Air Force. So they didn't make any distinction about the fact that it was uh, Air Force involved or anything. I just took the basic training that everybody else took. And it was more familiarization with, um, with a few weapons and, and running yourself to death and uh, physically, you know, physically exerting to get you in some kind of shape. Uh, it was no problem for me because I was already in good shape. I've been playing football for several years and um, I didn't have any problem with it at all. But I went, from, I went from basic training, and of course they gave you aptitude tests down there to find out where you probably ought to go in the military, where would be your best fit. And um, I made a big mistake at that point in time, looking back in hindsight, because I had, uh, I had a good ear for music, and I could uh, you know, relate to musical notes and things like that and keep music in mind. And when they gave the test for radio, uh, for radio operators or something like that, which is a rhythm-based test, really. It has a lot to do with your ability to um, remember and discern rhythms. Of course, I aced that test, and so that automatically sealed my fate. They're going to make a radio operator out of me. And um, so after basic training, I was transferred up to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, let me tell you, if you think red mud is sticky, you ought to try that black mud up there. That is the stickiest stuff I've ever seen in my life. It's like walking around in sorghum syrup. But anyway, I went up to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I was, I was a captive in that radio school. I sat there for hours to learn Morse code and a lot of the um, electronic, basic electronic equipment, things like that. Well, I had a, I had a good break there because um, about Two weeks before I was to graduate with that class, um, I got bronchitis. And my whole graduating class from Sioux Falls went to the 8th Air Force in England and ended up flying B-17s. And of course, as you know from talking to other people, the mortality rate on B-17 crews was just amazing. Uh, so um, that was a break, looking back. And the following week, they started the first group of uh, being that would go out and form crews on B-29s. The B-29 aircraft was just relatively new at that point in time. So um, I was assigned to that particular uh, group. But before I got to my actual training, they sent me to Madison, Wisconsin to take a intensive course in first aid. This was first aid that you would um, be needed to know about if you were in the air on a crane uh, to, you know, to um, handle anything that happened to the crews. And all I remember about that training was that those plasma needles were big. Boy, those things were big. They must have been about a half a foot in diameter. <laughs> but uh, spent, spent about a month up there, then I was transferred to Clovis, New Mexico. And that was one of the first training bases that uh, they were using to start training crews. Well, Clovis, New Mexico was out in the middle of nowhere. And the only real activity down there before, before they put the air base there, that was when the Union Pacific train came through there every week. That stirred up a lot of excitement. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we started our actual training, uh, flying training. And we started out flying B-17s because we did not have B-29s at that point in time to actually train with. So we uh, flew out of Clovis, New Mexico, and <clears throat> we uh, got very familiar with the B-17 aircraft and a lot of gunnery training, a lot of flying. And of course, that was the first time we had a chance to really operate the electronic equipment on those planes. Um, part of that time was uh, spent with what they call air-to-air -air gunnery. And that's when I found out who the bravest, who the bravest or the most foolish people were in the whole Air Force, and that's the guys that flew those planes that pulled tow targets. Because I think about a half the time the plane got hit more than the target did. Explain that. Well, you know, if you're flying out there and you've got an airplane that's pulling a sleeve, a big sleeve, maybe 15, 20 feet long, 
and the sleeve is probably a good 25 or 30 feet behind the tail of that plane that's pulling it. Uh, a lot of these guys never fired guns to speak of. And, um, you know, a 50 caliber machine gun on a flexible mount is uh, easy to swivel around. So it wouldn't be unusual for the guys to come back and give them a high score on the, on the plane, but a low score on the sleeve. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying those were the bravest or the most foolish guys in the whole Air Force that threw those darn target planes, you know. Well, we went, um, we went from Clovis after we had our, B our B-17 training. We went from Clovis up to Harrington, Kansas. Now, when the B-29 program started, they picked about four airfields in Kansas. And it became obvious why they did this, because uh, Kansas is a sort of a roll, rolling low country. And um, a B-29 at that point in time always took a lot of runway and took a lot of time to get up to a flying elevation to a flying altitude. So you had to have a clear place to fly. And the plane was still relatively new. Um, it really wasn't proven out. It was in the test phase, you might say, as were the crews. So we spent um, about two months up in Harrington, Kansas, you know, getting familiar with the B-29 and finding out the problems that we had to live with that airplane. And the biggest problem, which is well known at this point in time, we did not know it at the time. We did not know we were flying a plane that was um, really kind of unsafe. But the biggest problem with that plane was that the um, cylinder head temperature on takeoff, the engines would get so hot that either they would seize up or get on fire, or catch on fire, or something like that. So there was a real problem with that. And that stayed with the B-29 for a long time. That engine that was in there was, um, was a large engine. It was a 3,350 horsepower engine, which was way too big for that plate at that time. And they had to finally get around uh, that problem by taking them out. But anyway, we trained there for a couple of months and that's the first time I got exposed to radar because uh, the B-29 was the first aircraft that really had an airborne radar system on it that you could use for bombing or for navigation. It was called the ART-13, or the ALAPQ-13. And uh, it was quite a piece of equipment. <clears throat> well, when we got through about, this is what you call operational training. We had taken our basic flying training uh, in Clovis with B-17s. So when we got to Harrington, we'd actually got B-29s to fly. And uh, when we finished our operational training, then we went from there to Morrison Field, which is in West Palm Beach, Florida. Well, <clears throat> that was the end of the training, and that was the beginning of what really would be our assignment overseas, because Morrison was the jump-off point to go overseas. And when we got down to Morrison, of course, uh, we were issued of equipment that we hadn't seen before, for example. We, we issued things like, a lot of people don't know what a Mae West is, but a lot of people do, and a Mae West is a flotation jacket, really, that is powered by CO2 cartridges. And uh, we got our Mae West, and we were briefed on flying over the water, and we would issued our 45 cold sidearms, which a lot of folks said were useless, but that's not true. <laughs> and all of that kind of gear that we would need to make this flight. So we left, uh, we left Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, after that uh, brief stay there, and went down from there to, um, to Dutch, no, to British Guyana. We flew down to British Guyana, to Georgetown. And the air base there was really out in the jungle, and uh, there was just nothing there. And the thing I remember about the little experience at Georgetown, because we were only there overnight, really. It was just the beginning of a trip <coughs> to India. <coughs> but um, Two things that I remember. The uh, quarters were on stilts above the ground. And breakfast, I've never seen so many bananas in one place in all my life. There was bananas everywhere. So uh, we stayed there just overnight and got briefed on the rest of the trip and flew from there and sent into to uh, Natal, Brazil. Now, at that point in time, Natal was, uh, was populated, of course, you know, a lot of, a lot of people there. And when we got into Natal, we had an interesting experience. Uh, we were getting ready to go overseas, and B-29s had enough range and fuel capacity to fly from Natal to Accra, Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop. Most planes that went that way had to stop at Ascension Island, 
And the reason for that was they didn't have the fuel capacity to make the trip. The 29s did. And we were pre-flighting the aircraft the morning that we were going to leave to make this trip. And of course one of my duties was to check out all the radio antennas and things on the aircraft. And I was walking out on the wing, <clears throat> on the left wing of the aircraft, and I stubbed my toe and looked down and there were all the rivets on the main spar of that left wing had popped up. And of course if we had taken off and flown that plane we might have lost the plane on the way over. So you pretty much saved, saved the crew. Well, if, if I hadn't stubbed my toe, I guess we, you, know, you might put it that way. Uh, it probably did. But um, as a result of that, they had to have a crew come down from, I don't know if it came from Lockheed or from Wichita, Kansas, but they had a crew come down to repair that wing. So we suffered in Natal for 14 days. It was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We found all the cultural... That, that's talking cheek, I said. <laughs> we found all the cultural centers. <laughs> well, tell us about that. Well, some of these things are better not told. <laughs> Whatever you can. But uh, that, let's put it this way. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of counselors there. A lot of counselors that did a lot of help, a lot of good work for those crews before they went overseas. I understand. Those counselors were great. <laughs> I understand completely. But uh, <clears throat> then they finally brought a test pilot down. You know, from the uh, again, the Boeing company, um, but it could have been Bell because, as you may know, at that point in time, uh, B-29s were built in Seattle, Washington, Wichita, Kansas, and they had given Larry Bell, uh, who had an aircraft company up in Long Island, a contract, which is now the Lockheed Martin company out here at, Bob at Dobbins Air Base. Uh, they built that plant in record time. It was the biggest plant in the whole world. So the B-29s uh, were built there also, about 450 of them, I think, were built out there at, um, at Bell. And we never could decide whether we had a Bell or a Boeing plane, but we decided, we decided the way the plane performed, it had to be a Bell plane because it, um, it had a lot of problems. And we learned later more about that. But uh, anyway, we left Natal, Brazil. Oh, before we left, they brought this test pilot in. And our pilot, was very cautious about what he would do with that plane. He would not really get it up on one wing and just do a tight turn or anything like that because of afraid it would come apart. That guy that was a test pilot came down there and he put that thing through stuff that we didn't think you could do with a B-29. And um, that gave us a lot of confidence at that point in time that, well, right, this is really a good airplane. So having done all that, uh, we left and we left Natal and <clears throat> flew to Accra, Africa. Uh, that's the Gold Coast of Africa, on the east, uh, no, it's on the west coast, of course. And so we, we stopped there, and we spent about two days at a crawl. Uh, nothing there, really, except just the air base. Then we went to uh, uh, an interior base that was on Madugali, and I, I can't find it on the map today, but it was somewhere in Central Africa. And um, we had an interesting situation that happened. <clears throat> we took off from, from this Central Africa base heading for Khartoum, which is now in the Sudan. Um, we were up there about, oh, I don't know, 15, 20,000 feet, something like that. And we had packed all of our equipment, all of our personal belongings and things like that in the bomb bay of the B-29. And we, we had uh, what some of you might know as a B-4 bag, which is a pretty good sized bag with zippers on both sides where you can put a lot of stuff in. Well, the um, the left gunner on our crew, when he was in the towel, he bought a bunch of silk stockings, <clears throat> a bunch of scotch whiskey, um, various things like that, because this guy, this guy was from New York. He was street smart, okay? <laughs> he was probably the street smartest guy on the whole crew. So he had bought a lot of this stuff for the idea that I can trade this stuff when I get over to India, and he was right. But uh, we were flying up there, you know, going to Guitar Tune, and all of a sudden, we had a lot of gas fumes in the aircraft, just a lot of gas fumes. Well, you can't fly a plane with gas fumes uh, heavy without taking a real chance on having an explosion. So the pilot opened the Bombay doors to get the gas fumes out, and poor Marshall's B-4 bag went. <laughs> it fell out. And uh, years later, years later, uh, I asked him about that. He says, you know, 
says, I can just see it now. I can just see some lady sitting down there on a camel, smoking my cigars, wearing silk stockings, and drinking my scotch, and saying, Lord, send me another one of them big silver birds. <laughs> <laughs> so Marshall lost all of his goodies there, you know, and that was a real downer for him. Well, we landed to Khartoum, and uh, of course when we got there, we found out some interesting things. They had, you know, every seven years they have locusts. And uh, the locusts, this is the year of the locusts in Khartoum, and they were everywhere. And when you taxied the plane on the runway, it sounded like running over popcorn with all these locusts down there. And the other thing was they had um, the most crude form of air traffic control you ever saw in your life to clear the runway because there was sheep and goats and people and all this on the runway. And to clear this, they had an old gentleman with a beard that had a horn about 20 feet long that laid on the ground like one of these horns you see in the Swiss Alps, you know. And he'd blow that horn, <clears throat> and that would tell the people to get off the runway. It was a plane coming. And uh, so we uh, spent there about two days, and we found out those locusts were everywhere. They were in the mess hall, in the food. You couldn't get away from them. So we were glad to leave there. Well, we went, we went from Khartoum <clears throat> to Aden, Arabia. And we spent about a, a night and a half there at uh, Aden. And um, we found out really that um, most of the places we had been prior to that were pretty decent, but the place, the smell was bad. There were so many animals up there and, you know, it just had a bad, a bad smell to it. It was a dirty place. So we didn't stay there too long. And we flew from there to uh, Karachi, India. And we were getting very close to our destination at that point in time. Well, we stayed in Karachi about two days and we were assigned then to our permanent location, which was a, um, an air base that was about 35 miles west of Calcutta. Now the, uh, <clears throat> this was the 20th Air Force, by the way, at this point in time. Uh, they had established what they called the 20th Air Force. And so uh, we were assigned then to one of those bases. There was four bases over there around the Calcutta area. I remember there was a uh, Paradoba, uh, Calicundi, we were at a base called Dudkundi, and all of these were clustered around the Calcutta area. And uh, we were somewhat, we were somewhat surprised at the quarters and the living conditions there. They weren't, they weren't terrible, but it was something different. We had the, bu the buildings that we lived in were called bashers, B-A-S-H-A-S, and these bashers were um, built by the local Indian population. And they were bamboo frames, essentially, that were plastered with, with, uh, with cow poop, okay? There was plenty of that, but there wasn't much cement. So they were stuccoed, but um, pretty durable. And, of course, they had thatched roofs. And the uh, food over there, of course, at that point in time was pretty bad. Uh, most everybody was living off of K rations, and occasionally they would um, have roast beef. But we noticed that every time we had roast beef, the water buffalo population went down about 50, 60 water buffaloes. So we always suspected we were eating water buffalo when they were calling it roast beef. It was primitive, but, uh, you know, we, we expected it wasn't going to be like the, the uh, Hilton, somewhere like that. Well, anyway, uh, we started getting our flying assignments at that point in time. And, and by the way, we'd taken, we'd taken a B-29 over that... Um, we had given it the name. We picked this B-29 up in Harrington, Kansas, before we left to go overseas. And uh, our co-pilot's name was Arthur Schaefer, and he had just had a baby, and uh, he had named him Herbert. So we named this airplane Little Herbert, and um, that stuck with it for a long time. So we uh, we had Little Herbert assigned to us, and so when we got over there and finally got into the flying routine. Then we started flying from Dud County up to Chengdu, China. And of course, this would take us over the famous hump that everybody's always heard about. And, um, and I have to admit that that was a pretty, pretty scary experience, flying over those mountains like that because of the conditions of the weather up there. You never knew what you was going to run into. And uh, the weather was so violent that uh, a lot of people and a lot of planes were lost just doing routine flying across the hump. Well, what we were doing 
we were carrying ammunition, bombs, and gasoline to Chengdu, China, because they had established uh, Chengdu, which is in western China, as a location that would be pretty, pretty much removed from the Japanese, where the Japanese bombers would have a hard time getting there. And uh, there were three bases around the Chengdu area. And they used to refer to them as A1, A2, and A3. Uh, the names are difficult. We were going into Penguin Shan. And um, the only problem with that airport up there in that area was that you see the mountains. There were mountains all around those fields. And in that part of China, the weather was always overcast. And you never could ever see the ground until you broke out 1,500 feet or 1,000 feet above the ground. Of course, the mountains up there were 3,000, 4,000 feet. So there was always a lot of concern about making sure that you were going to be lined up you know, with the airport runway when you got down that low, because otherwise you'd fly into one of those hills or in the mountains. And they had some <coughs> typical radio navigational aids, but the problem was that they were low frequency. And when you're flying in the mountain area, the, the beams, the people always, you know, refer to flying the beam, which is a radio signal that emanates from the uh, airfield, they'll bounce off of the hills. So you could very easily pick up a beam that was a reflected beam and fly right into a mountain. So it's dangerous flying. And then, of course, hauling gasoline is always dangerous. So um, we cut our teeth on those kind of missions here for, for a while. And in the meantime, you know, we were doing a lot of flying. But uh, in the meantime, when we come back down to the bashers, then we found out that um, we could we could scrounge and find some ice cream mix, powdered ice cream mix, and put that stuff in a gallon can and put it in the bomb bay of the airplane. And we came back, we'd have a gallon of frozen ice cream. <laughs> but the other thing is, with the bashers, um, there were a lot of rats, and the rats lived in the thatch roof. So um, it got to be such a problem that we uh, had engaged some of the locals. And by the way, we, uh, we finally found a young boy, 14 years old, whose name was PMD. And we hired him like as a houseboy. He would do the cleaning. Uh, he'd take out the laundry and get it done. And by the way, cleaning the laundry was beating it on a rock, you know. And uh, if you had a good shirt, outside of about a month, it would be tattered because of the laundry. But we were concerned about snakes and rats, so we, uh, we got PMD to go out and buy us a, a mongoose. So we, uh, we tied this mongoose up there at the head of the bed there, you know, the foot of the bed, rather, and, and that did get with the rat population. Uh, we, don't, we didn't ever see him kill one, but let's put it this way, we didn't see many rats after we put him in there either, and, and no snakes. So uh, it wasn't dull living when we weren't flying. Well, after being there about, uh, about a month and a half, they transferred our crew. Uh, they transferred four of us. And by the way, the crews were 11-man uh, crews. They were 11-man crews, but we only had 10 men on our crew. We did not have a radar man at that point in time. So I was filling in as a radar operator as well as a radio operator. But anyway, they assigned us to temporary duty with the Air Transport Command, and they took four of us off of that 10-man crew. They took the pilot, the co-pilot, uh, the uh, tail gunner, and myself, and transferred us up to the Assam Valley to a place called Tezgon. Well, Tezgon was an ATC, ATC is Air Transport Command, uh, to that field, and we started flying gasoline to China. And what they had done, they had taken a B-24 airplane, which is a B-24 bomber, four-engine bomber, and stripped everything off of that plane. All the, everything that had weight, all the guns, anything they could get off of there, they took off and they put in gasoline tanks. They had Bombay tanks, wing tanks, nose tanks. It was a flying gas can is what it was. And you had no gunnery to speak of? You know. But when we actually got into the flying, it was only three men that flew, myself and the pilot and co-pilot. The gunner, there was really no need for him. So uh, we flew many, many trips uh, over the hump there to carry gasoline and, and such as to Chengdu, to the main base up there. 
and um, it was it was relatively dangerous flying. The, the gas fumes alone was a problem, but then flying across the hunt. And at that point in time, we were flying what they call the northern route. And the reason for that was that the Japanese were still in Michinar, Burma, and up as far as Imphal. And since the Japanese controlled that part of the country, we could not fly at a lower altitude. So we had to fly 23, 24, 25,000 feet uh, to clear the mountains to go the northern route. And um, that, was, that was not a very fun flight because you were on oxygen practically the whole way. And if you've ever worn an oxygen mask at altitude, it'll ice up on you. When you're breathing, it'll, it'll condensate and it'll ice up. And it's uncomfortable. But uh, we survived all that somehow. Did you have any fighter escort at all? Or no, you? no, no. As a matter of fact, um, that route that we flew is now referred to as Aluminum Road because there were so many planes that crashed. Yeah, you, you, didn't need, you didn't need a compass. If you could see the ground, you just follow the aluminum. But most of the flights across there were in violent weather. Um, most of the time you were on instruments. Uh, the downdrafts were, were pretty bad. You could be tossed around like a rag doll up there, you know, and a lot of planes were lost that way. But it was important because we were flying the supplies in that make it possible for the B-29 crews that were stationed up at Ching-2 to fly to Japan and fly those initial B-29 missions. And the first missions were to places like the uh, Yawada to the steel mills at Yawada and uh, Anchan and places like that, which was taking the war back to the Japanese in, in big time. I mean, that's the first time that we really started hitting the uh, empire with bombs that really would go and do damage. And of course, the Japanese were very aware of Ching Tu's existence, and they were also trying to, uh, you know, make it difficult. They bombed the place, they did not. It was supposed to be too far to the west, but they got in there and they were bombing that uh, field up there also. But uh, <clears throat> while we was up there, I had a, a couple of interesting experiences. Um, came back one night from one of these flights. It was about three o'clock in the morning and walked into this basher and went in, but got in bed, you know. And by the way, uh, you know, these beds, when I say got in beds, they were army cots with uh, mosquito bars. Uh, which is mosquito netting that you could put as a shroud over the uh, cot there because uh, malaria was a real serious problem. And so outside of taking out of green tablets, which would turn you a little bit yellow, which made it good with the Chinese because we talked as one of them. <laughs> but uh, outside of adabrine, there wasn't much prevention and a lot of people got malaria over there, of course, which was devastating. It would just really do a number on you. Well, anyway, um, I was tucked in good one night, and I always slept with my 45 pistol under my pillow and a flashlight. I always had a pistol and a flashlight under the pillow. Well, um, one night I came in and I turned in, and about, oh, I don't know, half an hour later or something like that, I heard this growling. And it woke me up, and uh, the, the uh, gunner and myself, how cots were next to each other. We had two foot lockers between those two cots. Well, I looked up there, I took the flashlight and looked up there and there's a black leopard sitting on one of the foot lockers. So I thought, well, if I shoot, it may go through him and hit my, my gunner. If I miss, it'll certainly hit him. And so I thought, well, what in the world am I going to do? Well, it turned out there was a leopard on the foot locker and there was another leopard down the other way. I assume they were male and female. There were no windows, they were openings, but no windows, or no doors, they were just openings. So apparently they'd come into that basher. And about that time, one of the guys from another crew comes in and he was juiced up. He was about half potted. And he had taken his shoes off and had them around his neck, you know, the shoelaces is tied. And he walks into that, he walks into that basher. And he's about 25 feet from where that leopard was. And that leopard let out a big growl. He said, Ah, shut up! And he took his shoes off and threw them over there, and those two cats went out both ends, <laughs> both ends of that basher. And I'm sitting there with my mouth hanging open, you know. <laughs> and uh, that brings up another story I'll tell you about real quickly, which is kind of funny. Um, it was cold, and so um, a lot of the nights up there were really cold. 
And one night up there, you know, I'm laying in there asleep, and, and we had this mongoose that I was telling you about. So uh, I'm lying there, and all of a sudden I feel something down at the foot of the cot there, you know, nuzzling around down there, and I'm thinking, it's a cobra, <laughs> you know, probably a cobra. So I get the pistol and the flashlight, and I look down there, and it was that during mongoose. He had buried up in there to get warm himself. I'd have probably shot my foot off <laughs> if it had been something else. <laughs> So again, I just got lucky, I guess. But anyway, um, we did a lot of flying out of out of uh, out of uh, Tesgon up there, and uh, flying gas and ammo. Then, about that point in time, the Americans and the British were able to run the Japanese out of Michinar. They won the uh, the fight up at Michinar. Well, that changed the whole ball game, because now uh, we didn't have to fly the northern route which was, you know, much easier for us. It didn't require going up to as much altitude. It was a little bit safer and it was an easier trip. So we started flying what they call the southern route. Um, and the southern route, of course, took us back to the same place for the same purpose. And um, the only thing I can remember about Michener at that point in time was that the airfield was nothing but a riverbed. It was just a riverbed with a lot of round river rock in there. It wasn't paved or anything like that. And there was there was a jillion C-46 airplanes up there that they were using to fly the giant, the Chinese troops back and forth between Burma and, and uh, China. And of course that was an air transport command operation. But, uh, and about not, what period was this? This was, this was really in the, say the middle latter part of 44. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. To put, it, to put it in a timeline, yeah. And um, so anyway, we uh, did that for a long time and then when we finally came back to Dud Cundy, when we came back off of temporary duty, then we expected to start flying, you know, regular B-29 missions, which we did. And our first mission was against Singapore. And, uh, it, you know, by this point in time, we were all anxious to go ahead and fly a couple of these missions and get it out of our system. Well, we uh, started off for Singapore and got out over the Bay of Bengal. And at this point in time, we were supposed to transfer fuel we had fuel transfer pumps on the aircraft. It wouldn't work. We couldn't transfer fuel. So we sat there flying around for an hour trying to figure out some way to get those fuel transfer pumps to work and they, didn't, they wouldn't work. So we didn't have any choice but to abort the mission and go back. So we all had to abort our very first mission. And that was, that was terrible. That was just demoralizing, it really was. Well, we had a second chance very shortly after that. And, uh, we flew our, our really first real combat mission was flown against Rangoon, Rangoon, Burma. And of course the Japanese, that was a major storage area for them. They had tons of munitions and things stored at Rangoon. And that was a, that was a successful mission. Um, we had good luck. We didn't get shot up too much or anything like that. A lot of planes were lost. We were lucky. Now I will say this. Uh, the guy that was the pilot on my aircraft was absolutely one of the best. He was a fireman in civilian life from Buffalo, New York, and he was Mr. Cool. You could not get him rattled. And uh, he never raised his voice on the intercom under stressful situations at all. Never raised his voice. Um, just, just a superb pilot, really good. And probably, we give him credit for the fact that we're still here probably. You know, we might, might not have been there with some other pilot perhaps. And I, uh, I have to go back to another story that you might want to hear about. When we were flying these uh, converted B-24s, by the way, they call these C-109s. We call them C-10 booms because of the fact that they were blowing up so much. But we were flying up to uh, Chengdu one night on instruments, and we were up around 23, 24,000 feet and lost an engine. Well, we started losing altitude because the plane was loaded to the max, and you just couldn't fly it on three engines at that point in time. And, well, we didn't know where we were, and uh, we were in fog, and you couldn't see the, anything. So he said, well, he says, you know, uh, I don't know where the mountains are. I don't know what altitude we've got to contend with, so get ready to bail out. So I got my parachute on. I got out in the bomb bay and plugged into the intercom. I was ready to go. And he'd opened the bomb bay doors and I looked out there and there was nothing but just pitch black. 
And I'm thinking, Lord have mercy, what in the world is that? What, what is on the ground down there? And we'd had crews that had to walk out of the Himalayas, and it was a month, four weeks, five weeks. Uh, they were headhunters. So it wasn't anything anybody was looking forward to. Anyway, I was just, I was ready to go. And about that time, that calm voice comes on the, on the uh, intercom and says, well, says, just relax. Says, I think I can fly this thing. Huh. And he did a 180 and headed back for Mitchell now. And I sure am glad he did. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worst thing about having to walk out of the Himalayas is you'd ruin your shoes in a week. There was so much rock and stuff that was so sharp, but a pair, a pair of jump boots wouldn't last over a week. Did quite a few guys make it back doing that? Quite a few did, but most in every case, in every case, it was with the help of, uh, of natives. Very few made it back that had to walk out on their own. And one of the other unique things about that part of the experience was the fact that you may not have heard of what they call a blood chit or an escape flag. Yeah, all of all Explain of what that yeah, is. all of us wore on the back of our jackets a flag, which had a combination of the Chinese nationalist flag and the American flag, and there was Chinese uh, characters or letters there that said, it. in essence, I never found a Chinese that could read these things over here and tell me what it really said, but it said in essence that this is an American flyer. Uh, if you will help him get back to his base, then we will pay you. X numbers of dollars or something like that. And of course, that was pretty good motivation in itself. But there's a lot of stories about guys that had to bail out, or had to walk out, and boy, I'm telling you, they were harrowing stories. But we were very fortunate. And I, uh, I've often thought about that and thought that, well, if, if my pilot had been a lot younger, by the way, he was 26 years old, which was old man for flying an airplane. And if it had been somebody that was younger and, and got rattled easy, we might have all bailed out up there, you know, and no telling what would have happened. But um, he, uh, he saved the day. Well, anyway, we got back and we got back into the flying routine out of India. And about that time, they decided to transfer the 20th Air Force to the Marianas Islands. And um, all this time, we'd been flying Little Herbert. Well, as luck would have it, and you, a lot of people can relate to this, my pilot was a first lieutenant, and we had a new crew come in that had a major for a pilot. So uh, when the major came in, he outranked my pilot, and they took the airplane. They had no flying experience at that time or anything, they just came into you, but, but rank had its privilege. You've heard RHIP all your life. And it had its privilege, and he got the airplane. Well, what that really boiled down to was that they flew, they flew from India to Tinian in the Marianas. We went by ship. So we started a 45-day a trip, and um, we were taken down to Calcutta and put on there were two ships that moved the 24th Air Force. This was mostly the ground support people and the, um, a, lot of, a lot of other crews also. We were not the only crew. But most of them uh, were lucky and got to fly over there, and they did it in a couple of days. Well, we got on two ships down there. Uh, the one we were on was the General James H. McRae. And the McRae was about a 550-foot uh, high-speed transport that they'd converted into a troop carrier. And it was crammed. I mean, they had people hanging out the portholes practically. Well, we started our trip from Calcutta, heading for Tinian. And of course, uh, one of the first things that we heard was the radio was Tokyo Rose, our dear friend. Good music, good music. The Tokyo Rose says, um, says we know where you're going, you know, and says we've got submarines out there, you know, and you'll never get there. Says, you know, we'll, we'll sink you before you get 100 miles off of the Indian coast. Well, we had two DEs with us also. We had two destroyer escort uh, ships with us. So we started out from India and uh, went down around the south side of Australia and ended up, the first port of call we really made was at, uh, at Melbourne, Australia. Well, now this is where it gets interesting. 
Melbourne, Australia, when the 3rd and 4th Marine Division had come out of Guadalcanal and, and some of those engagements over there, they were given liberty in Melbourne, Australia. They turned that place upside down, it's, which is understandable. And uh, it was so upsetting to the locals down there that they closed the, they closed the town to American servicemen. There hadn't been an American man there since the 3rd and 4th Division was there. And um, we had some pretty good intervention by some pretty high brass. And they uh, begged, pleaded, maybe even bribed, I don't know, <laughs> bribed the local officers to, to let us off of there for a while. And so we got, we got a 12-hour liberty in Melbourne. And that probably was one of the wildest scenes I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it, was, it was unusual. The first thing was, it's the first time anybody had seen anybody that spoke English outside of the Americas. And, um, and not only that, but the Australians make black beer. And so uh, a lot of people really found that black beer to be a liking, you know. But the Aussies were very friendly. They were good people and they, uh, they made us feel welcome and we enjoyed it. It just didn't last long enough, that's all. So anyway, um, when the time came to load back on the ship to leave, there's a lot of guys didn't make it. A lot of guys did not make get back onto the ship in time. But uh, we took on off, of course, and started on our destination to uh, Tinian. Well, we stopped at Townsville, Australia, which is up the coast, and picked up 500 uh, guys from the Royal Australian Air Force, the RAAF. And these guys bought with them a bunch of hardtack crackers, which is the worst stuff I would put in my mouth. That stuff was terrible. But they seemed to like it. So we, we took them up to, to New Guinea and let them off. And then, of course, we had several different uh, uh, places where we stopped along the way for maybe overnight or something like that. The one that I remember the most was Ulithi. Because when we got to Ulithi, the Fifth Fleet was in there. And um, this was aircraft carriers. They were getting ready for the invasion of uh, Okinawa. And uh, there was battleships in there, aircraft carriers. I've never seen so many ships in all my life. Uh, very impressive. So uh, we left Ulithia, of course, the next day and uh, finally ended up in Tinian. Well, Tinian didn't have a deep harbor where you could offload at a dockside. And, of course, um, that presented a problem. And, of course, a Navy guy and a Marine would just laugh his self to death about this because uh, the way we had to get off that ship was on cargo nets. And if you can imagine a bunch of Air Force guys that had never been on a cargo net with a barracks bag and a helmet liner and an M1 rifle and, and all this stuff, and then on top of that, to make it worse, there was enough tide that the LSTs were up and down, up and down. So you had to jump off that cargo net at the, wrong, at the right time or you could bust your tail, I'm not kidding you. So anyway, uh, they, that, and that Navy crew just sit there and he hoed while these guys were getting off that uh, ship. But we had the last laugh. We had the last laugh on them. Um, as anybody in the service knows, there was a, there was a poker game 24-7. All day, all night, there was somebody playing poker down there. And of course, the, um, the meals on the ship were about two a day because the line was so long. By the time you got through a breakfast, it was time for supper. <laughs> you got it. But the food was good. And... Um, the only problem was it was just too long between. So we had found out that uh, the food locker, we, we'd watched the Navy crew, we found out the food locker was, by the way, we were on D-deck. And from D-deck down, there's not much except salt water, I think. I think there's a bilge and that's about it. But um, we found out the food locker was just below us, below D-deck. Well, we had a guy in our uh, crowd who was a locksmith. This guy had been a professional locksmith in New York. So we started watching the crew, and of course the officer of the deck would come around there on a routine. It just got to, it was a routine every time you could see him, you know, and you knew when he was going to be there and how long he was going to be there. So we started timing this, and we set up a schedule, and we got that locksmith to pick that lock after he had left. And um, several of us went down in the uh, in the food locker there, and we were handing out big old gallon cans of fruit cocktail, grapefruit juice, everything you could think of. And guys were storing it in their barracks bags. 
and we cleared that place out. And so uh, when we finally debarked over there on Tinian, um, we hadn't been there about three or four days, and the commander of, of the squadron got a telegram from the ship's captain, and he was congratulating him on the fact that he was now about a week's ration short. And not only that, to make matters worse, we'd stolen one of his water coolers. They'd taken it apart and spread it out, you know, among different bags. bags. And they stole his water cooler, stole about half of his food, and um, it, it was laughable, really. Well, when we got on Tinian, we really figured, well, okay, you know, this is going to be nice. We're going to be in a nice set of quarters and we'll finally have a good place to stay and the food will be good and all that. Wrong. They took us out to a field. It was a field of sugar cane, it was just a cane field. There was nothing there. And they issued machetes and said, okay, guys, this is your new home. Clean the place up and have at it. So uh, we started cleaning up this cane field. And there was a squadron of aviation engineers right across the road from us. Uh, they were black, black aviation engineers. And they were jabbing and pointing over there where we were cutting this cane and, you know, like they were upset about something. And then we found out why. We started hitting nail kegs that were about half buried in the ground. And these guys had made a raisin jack and, and put it in these lined nail kegs and they stored all this stuff out in this cane field. That was their booze, okay? <laughs> so we were cutting into their booze and that was upsetting. Uh, nobody that I can recall had the nerve to try it to see what it tastes like. But anyway, we ended up clearing the field, and we had then they gave us what they call perimeter tents. These are six-man tents, and so we erected tents and, and started getting into the routine there. Uh, <coughs> the food was, uh, it's the first time we ever had sea ration stew. And after K rations, it wasn't bad. It wasn't too bad at all. A lot of beef in it, and that was pretty good. And of course the coffee was, uh, was made in a 55-gallon garbage can but it was always plenty of it available. So uh, things were looking up, except for the tents. Well, that's when we started doing our flying, uh, serious flying. So we started flying our missions uh, up to Japan and um, did several of them, of course. But um, Tinian itself was such a change from being over in India, in Burma, in that area, in China. Uh, you know, the, the, the temperature was moderate. The climate was moderate. About the only entertainment we, we had was there was a, um, a nice place to swim offshore. So you could swim offshore there. Now I had, um, I had always said that, you, you know, this story that you can't hit anything with 45 pistol was just a myth. So I used to take my pistol and take a box of ammunition and go down to the, to the cliffs. Uh, and take Coke cans down there and throw the Coke cans down there in the car and, and just pot away at them, you know, with that 45 pistol. And you can hit something with a pistol. Of course, I grew up with guns. I had guns all my life, so it wasn't anything new to me. But I was down there one day potting away and I started hearing some shots that were not mine. And then when one ricocheted off the car all over there, I realized that somebody was shooting at me. And we had Japanese holdouts that were in the caves down there. And some Japanese were sitting over there maybe a quarter of a mile away or something like that. And he was taking target practice too. So uh, I decided that maybe this is not the smartest thing to do. So I quit going down there shooting those Coke cans. <laughs> Did anybody go in after the holdouts? Or? No, not at that point in time. They were, not, they were not creating that much of a problem. They would come out at night sometimes and try to raid the food storage. Um, another thing that was different for the Air Force guys was that we had to have our own perimeter defense and had to man our own perimeter defense. So obviously on the worst night in the whole year when it was raining like crazy and no moon out and all that, guess who got the duty? And not only that, but the duty I got was between two cane fields when you couldn't see hardly your hand before your face. And um, so I was carrying an M1 carbine. We're walking down there between those cane fields, and I hear the cane rustling, of course, and I figured, well, that's one of those Japanese holdouts just trying to get that steal food from the food, from the food dump. And um, so anyway, um, it wasn't a Japanese, it was a pig. 
But uh, when I got off a couple of rounds with that, with that carbine, that pig didn't come back again. And of course, the officer of the day was down there in the Jeep, no time to find out what was going on. And uh, I don't know whether he was dressed that pig out and cooked him or not. But uh, Was this about the point where you started flying over Japan? No, this was after. This was somewhere this was in, in, in between. Oh. But um, we did, uh, we were flying every other day, almost every other day. Gotcha. But every other day we were flying up there, and it was intensive. And the biggest thing that changed on that, Joe, the biggest thing that changed was that the 20th Air Force, by the way, this was the 58th bomb wing of the 20th Air Force. There were four bomb wings over there in the Marianas. And uh, two of them were on Tinian, one was on Guam, and one was on Saipan. Um, we were at the west field of Tinian, and there was another group at the north field, and uh, that gets to be interesting because that involves the Anola Gay. So uh, we were flying almost every other day or so uh, up to Japan. But the point is, when we started out flying, we were flying and bombing at, at pretty high altitudes. We were going up there and flying at 20,000 feet, 25,000 feet, but we weren't hitting anything. Yeah, not the you know, the results were pretty poor. That's when we got introduced to General Curtis LeMay. Yeah, you know, this may be a good time to stop and change tapes. Okay. And, uh, okay. Am, I, am I going into too much detail? Not at all. Not at all. This, this is wonderful. Uh, but the tape's got about two more minutes on it, I think. So rather, this would be a good time to stop and change tapes because we, we want to hear about the flights over Japan and okay. Curtis LeMay. If you'd like to get up straight. No, I'm fine. Right. I'm fine. Yeah, you got some great stories. This is I mean, fascinating. Really it truly is. Well, you know, some of them interesting, I guess. They're but, all uh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were lucky. We were probably one of the luckiest crews of all. Really? Uh, yeah, we just, we never had anybody really get hurt except our navigator. Yeah, I'm gonna. That's one thing I was yeah. gonna ask you. Yeah. I'll get into that. Have you had uh, reunions at all, or gone back mm -hmm. with the? Mm -hmm. I didn't ever go to them until about a couple of years ago, but uh, I did go to one at Branson, Missouri, and and one to uh, St. Louis. And of course, I'm definitely gonna go to one this year at Dayton, Ohio. Oh yeah. Because that's up at the Air Museum. Yeah. And. Um, this camera, this a, I've got to get somebody to help me change it because I don't know how to change it on okay. this camera. Unless you think you could figure it out, Joe, because yeah. I know you've done a lot of stuff like this. So this is a different camera. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you've you got the small, you've got the compact too. Right, you have to remove it. I know that much. You do have to, I better go get wrestling. Yeah, you might. Okay. You have to remove it from the thing somehow. It changes Oh, you got to take it off of the... Uh, I'll let, let somebody else do that so I don't screw up the camera. Yeah, those uh, those compact tapes, are, um, I'm not real pleased with them. I've got one that's sort of uh, comparable to that. They don't have enough run time on them. Yeah. <coughs> the one we were using, they said yeah. it got stolen, but you it was about... You had the VHS tape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the same, it was a small tape, but it was still good. Yeah. And it, But it but it still only had an hour. So you always had to change tapes at the end of the hour. Well, is your pilot... The, still alive, the pilot, mm -hmm. is he? Yeah, there's, um, there's uh, four of us still alive, as far as we know. Out of how many? Out of uh, ten. Ten. Huh. The, uh, there's, one, there's one guy, we just can't find him. Huh. We just can't find him, brother. And I've tried any number of ways to try to, you know, get a hold of him. I've tried all the search engines, and <clears throat> I've tried contacting the uh, Social Security, the Veterans Association. Uh, the problem with trying to find somebody nowadays is the Privacy of Information Act. Yeah, that's right. It keeps popping up. Every yeah, time you yeah. try to find somebody, you run into the Privacy of Information Act. So I, I was on a merry-go-round for a long you know time. You're going to have to figure it out. Have you ever run into... Uh a man by the name of Paul Crawford. He, he was he's born in Atlanta. He was born the same year you were. He went to Tech, and he, he flew uh, Mustangs in the same uh, over the mm -hmm. over Europe. The hump. Uh, no, he. Oh no, he's in flying. Yeah, uh, okay. flying Taggers. Not out the original flying Taggers, but right. I'm with on, you. And he got shot down and did what you were talking about. He he was escorted by 
Johnny's. Yeah, I was trying to think of who. I knew we had done one, and I couldn't think of Maybe. We have to figure this out. Let's go 